Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to our talk, Empowering Design, the Tools and Pipelines of Unpacking. Uh, <laughs> hello, uh, I'm Tim Dawson. Uh, on unpacking, uh, <clears throat> yeah, can you coming? Uh, on, on unpacking, I was the technical director, meaning I was responsible for programming, including our tools. Uh, I also worked very closely with Ren on the design of the game. Uh, I've worked, uh, so as for my background, I've worked in games since 2004. Uh, I've mostly been an animator, but I always had a strong interest in design and prototyping. Uh, in, 20, in 2013, I helped start Witchbeam and made the twin six shooter Assault Android Cactus. On that game, I was programmer, artist, animator, and one of the designers. I think being across so many disciplines did a lot to shape my perspective about the roles of tools and, uh, and tool design. And I tried to put that into practice in unpacking. In, uh, in unpacking. <laughs> and I'm Ren Breyer. I was the creative director on Unpacking. I've worked in games since 2013, so about 10 years less than Tim almost. Um, but 10 years now, I guess. My background is in mobile games, uh, most notably as an artist on Jetpack Joyride. Um, but I've also worked on some other games, including some games that never really saw the light of day and you would not have heard about, you know, how games be. Before unpacking, I was a generalist 2D games artist with a focus on pixel art and uh, UI and UX. And I also dabbled a bit on production where I could. And on unpacking, because we were such a small team, uh, I took on many additional roles, including, uh, most relevantly for this talk, level design. I worked very closely with Tim and worked uh, in Engine a lot using the tools that he created. Oh, yes, so let's talk about unpacking. Um, for anyone fami unfamiliar with the game, Unpacking is a chill puzzle game about, well, unpacking. Uh, the familiar experience, uh, experience of pulling possessions out of boxes and fitting them into a new home. Uh, part block fitting puzzle, uh, puzzle, part home decoration, you are invited to create a satisfying living space while learning clues about the life you're unpacking. We made the game over a period of three and a half years with a core team of just four people. We released it nearly two years ago. Um, oh God, uh, I don't know how it's been that long already. And thankfully, lots of people liked it. We even got a chance to dress up and go to the BAFTAs. <laughs> Just recently, we released Unpacking on iOS as well and on Android. Um, which means it's now pretty much on everything uh, and that friend you recommended it to had, no longer has any excuse not to play it. Uh, you may have seen our trailer by this point, but we are going to roll it anyway as a refresher of our game and uh, the systems we're about to dive into. Keep a lookout for the way items, grids, and boxes behave and interact.
Nope. That is not what I meant to do. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, so why does, why does a game need tools? Uh, now, I'm not trying to convince you that a game needs tools. We trust you already know that. Uh, but it's worth asking this question so we can get back to first principles. And by stating our goals, uh, we can use that as our guiding star for when we develop tools and know where we put our time and energy. So for starters, tools are how the non-programmers uh, build stuff in the game. So they can help empower people in different disciplines to be hands-on and have a better relationship with the project that they're part of. Tools should also help us work faster and in better ways. A tool that makes it easy to redo something or make a change with a click of a button and feels safe to use will actively encourage better game design because everyone will want to try out more things and not just settle for the first result that works. Repetitive tasks are also generally a sign you need a tool. Computers are way better than humans at doing something a thousand times. So let's shove that logic into a for loop and save the human brain power for the creative, creative decisions. And because tools can wrap complex action in a human-friendly interface and turn repetitive tasks into something automatic and prevent known issues from occurring, good tools means that everyone makes less mistakes. So what, what kind of tools did we need for unpacking? Because art and design were so intrinsically tied together in this game, I wanted to be able to start designing each level by drawing a room in my art program first, and then figure out grids for where items can be placed based on that. I needed a good way to create and edit these grids, um, ideally in a visual way, so that I could make sure the grids were precisely aligned with the environment. Items are the most important part of unpacking, so I needed flexible tools that let me create items, copy them, and edit them many times over. Probably my biggest ask of Tim was for a way to edit levels in Unity while in play mode. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> I wanted to be able to add and remove items from the level visually so I could make sure they actually fit the space. Though we didn't know the game would end up having over 1,000 items uh, when we first started, our initial prototype of just one room already had 70 items. So we knew we would need some good data management solutions. We ended up with a whole suite of tools, all made by Tim. We had a zoning tool for setting up the environments and grids in our levels. We had a powerful item tool, which we used to make and edit items and set up all their properties. My favorite tool was the placement and packing tool, which let us take the items we made and place them in the environments we set up, and then pack up all the items and boxes for players to unpack. Uh, we had some mass automation tools for shifting data back and forth between spreadsheets and the project, which were really handy for audio and localization especially and many other little tools that did very specific tasks but made our lives a lot easier. So in unpacking, uh, every room has an underlying grid that's vital to gameplay. This grid controls where the items can go. It's used to draw everything in the right order. Uh, it contains information about where items can be left to finish the level, and even what a surface sounds like. As Ren mentioned, we wanted the flexibility for the grid to adhere to the art and not the other way around. So what was the earliest version of our zoning tool like? Well, it was Photoshop. Uh, it was better than hard coding the grid positions. Um, what, uh, and defining the positions in a PSD file meant that you could uh, kind of live update uh, things with a changeable graphics file. And it made taking, uh, yeah, it made taking a, uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> We'd make this file, or I'd make this file, by taking Ren's art and then dropping a little pixel, you can see on the, on the slide to the, over there, uh, right at the midpoint of each grid point that she'd defined. Um, and uh, yeah, just dotting over art, basically. Then in game, you'd read in this in, uh, I'd read in the image and I'd get a great big color array. I'd skip any black pixels and use the color information of what was left to build my grid. I used the green channel to set the depth of the, of the grid, um, the, the grid tile, blue to set the uh, type, and red was left over for any other data I needed. So how did that go? It did work. 
And technically, it ticked all the boxes. You could make grids that way. But it was really easy to make mistakes, like not spacing the dots perfectly, or forgetting to hide the level art before you imported it back into Unity, which would cause the image processing routine to think every single pixel in the image was a grid tile, which got a little bit messy. And while in theory, having three 0 to 255 values is a lot of permutations, it's not exactly easy to figure out what's going on without an eyedropper tool, a sheet of, a sheet of notes, and a lot of patience. So yeah, had some limitations. The dot method did create working grids though, which let us get on with other parts of the gameplay and learn more about the problem. By the time I got around to approaching the editor, I'd learned a lot about our needs. It was surprisingly difficult to get selecting and editing grids working in game view, uh, the game view panel when not in play mode. I won't get into the specifics for the Unity de developers in the audience, but it involved man manually managing the event queue. But once I had the fundamentals working, other features were often easy to implement. And while, photo, while the Photoshop method was limited by needing to fit everything into three color channels, now I just had data and I could do whatever I wanted with it. So when it came time to implement how cupboard doors work, for instance, building into the zone editor tool made sense because doors check the grid for collision so I could reuse my grid selection code. And as we built stages with more and more rooms, the zone editor tool wasn't just a way to set grids, it became the preferred way to switch rooms for everyone on the team uh, because it was easier and cleaner than like going into a scene and toggling on and off hierarchy. Um, so this is going to be a this is going to be a video showing how the tool actually worked. So let's let's go. So okay, here we are. We're going to open up the zone editor tool, and this is some art that Ren's made, and we're going to grid it from scratch to show, show the process. So the first thing I'm going to grab. This is a grid file that Ren has made. This, this is just an image on top. And I'm going to use this as a reference to build the actual grid that works in the game. So I set, start by setting a horizontal grid. We've got flat ones and some sideways ones. So I get the one lined up exactly right. And now I can just like grow it into the shape of this, this pillow shape. Uh, there's a dim, dim background to make it easier to set, see what's going on. Like a lot of like quality of life improvements I did. Uh, yeah, so it takes a little bit of time to line up the first one, and then the rest of them just go in like this. Da, 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 da. I'm gonna speed up a little bit, but you get the idea. It makes it really easy to like grid anything that you can kind of come up with. Uh, this is a wall grid. They work kind of the same way, but we basically have flat grids, left grids, and right grids. There we go. Yeah, and like a lot of the grids are just expanding them to fill spaces because a lot of spaces are square. But if they're not square, it's also very easy just to kind of dot them in. Uh, now this is setting up the heights. So this is how we define how tall a surface is. So these shelves can only fit objects up to a certain height. And you can see visually I'm just walking down this like indicator so that I can visually see if something will line up. And it's all very visual. If this is set correct, the rest of the game works. Because ultimately it's a 2D game, so everything's fake but it's just all about what looks correct. Uh, this is defining the types. So by setting this as like a bed type, it means that objects that can be left on a bed can go there, desk, uh, table. You can see we have a bunch of different zones defined, um, shelves. And you just kind of tag things up and it's all color coded. And now this is defining uh, grids that are not visible. Like they're off, the, they're, they exist, but they're kind of not seeing them. That's used for logic to make item selection work a bit better. And now we're setting up audio, I think this is. So this is for Jeff. Um, we, we can tag things and it's independent of their surface type. So it can be a desk, but we can still make it sound like board or something else. Uh, and now this is the final, this is the last step. Once we have the grids in place, we can align all these graphics to the grids. And you can see we're still using the zone editor tool. Uh, I just select the piece that I want and I snap it to either in front or behind a grid. And this is the workflow we did for setting up most of the levels. Um, and obviously this is, we didn't start with this workflow, we refined it over the course of the game, but it got pretty good. This is the multi-room workflow. You can see you can switch between rooms really easily, switch between the states, um, see all the color coding, turn doors on and off, because you've got like uh, wardrobes and you need to see inside the wardrobe. Technically, pillows are doors. <laughs> Game dev secrets. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and this is the uh, door editor tool. 
So you can see, you can flip through the frames um, and you can see which, which uh, grid, grids it's gonna hit on uh, as it opens up and this is used for the gameplay. And so again, everything is very visual and intuitive and you just build up a, a door, set what's gonna collide with things. You can turn on and off grids. So you could use the zone editor tool even just to, uh, to like look at the artwork uh, by just turning off all the grid stuff and then you can just flip through rooms. Oops, sorry. Initially, the, um, the pillows also made the door noises. <laughs> it was great. Um, the zoning tool was essential for building our levels. It let us add surface grids to stages and move them around, edit their many properties, add grids to walls, and more. After using this tool for a while, I asked him if I could do a UX pass on it to make it a little easier for me to use. I didn't make too many changes to this one, uh, mainly just adding color contrast between different categories of buttons to make them easier to parse. There are limitations to what I could do. I could only make buttons darker. I couldn't make them lighter. So it was, it was pretty limited um, UX changes, but I did what I could. Um, and uh, I added little category headers and changed some button sizes. So for example, you can see uh, there's a uh, set materials button in the before that is huge. Tim's gonna, thank you, Tim. Yeah, it's enormous and I never used it. Uh, and I kept accidentally clicking it while trying to click the smaller button above it. So I made it much smaller and moved it out of the way. Next up, we have the item tool. We started out with no tool at all, uh, just me making sprites in a sprite, which was uh, the R program I used, and then passing them on to Tim to implement them uh, as prefabs one by one into the game. As you can imagine, that was very manual and took a lot of time and work. It was also a one-way process for me. I would make item art and pass it on to Tim, and that was it. I didn't really have the know-how to go in and make changes on the, edits, uh, on the engine side. I could only replace the sprite if I wanted to, but that was about it. I couldn't be hands-on and iterate on the items. I also couldn't create placeholder items. Um, items needed to have art first before they could exist in the game. Tim's tool solution was the excellent, um, although boringly named, item tool. It's quite elaborate and took a lot of work, but boy was it worth it. It let us make placeholder items in the shape of blocks, as you can see here, um, with a name written over them, which we would use to populate the various rooms in the game before any art came in. It also let us edit any properties of an item from its dimensions in the game to where it's allowed to be placed in the level. This tool kept growing to accommodate the needs of the team and the project. Once a tool exists, it's much easier to add to it than uh, to make something from scratch. All right, so this is the uh, item tool and how it worked. So open the item tool and you can see right away you get a, a little blank one. And now this is the first way to flick through the items. We can just like browse through them alphabetically uh, with the next item button. And you can see all the properties that are showing up here. Uh, and so here's the dragon toy. And you can see it's got multiple rotations. You can see the art that's defined there. Notice that not all the art's defined. Anything that's not defined, it figures out by flipping and you know reusing. Um, it's quite like, yeah. it. It works with what you give it. Uh, this is a search box, so you can use it to like find items in the in the project. Um, and uh, what, what are we going to look at? <laughs> there we go. Oh, and this is so this is setting up complex behavior like stacking. Bowls can stack on each other, so we need to be able to set what height do the bowls stack on. And you can see this is we're visually defining it, but you can also toggle on the graphics so you can line up to the pixel what the uh, you know where the bowls should stack to get everything. You know, right, right on the pixel. Um, this is creating a new item. Uh, from, uh, so by dragging in a graphic, now notice everything's blank here, and I've just dragged in the plush duck graphic. It's named the item plush duck. It's found that there's a plush duck unders underscore reverse, and it's filled it in. It's put the shadows in. Basically, the item is practically already done here. We just have to change the box size to fill up the sprite. So it was basically designed to like, if you start with art, it can use the art. If you start with nothing, it can use that. Very flexible from any, any direction. So this is the in-game editing stuff that uh, Ren was mentioning before. We can select an item straight from game view. The game's running, you can see. 
And so here, here's the pig toy and we can inspect its properties and now we can toggle on the show valid grids and this shows everywhere that the pig toy can go in this room. Uh, and we can change it. We can, uh, so we can decide, actually it's, not, it's allowed on the desk now and it just updates. Uh, actually it's not allowed on the bed anymore, not a valid spot. Um, you can also, yeah, discard changes, it'll just put it back. Everything's very kind of easy to use and there's nothing that will kind of go disastrously wrong. Now this is an example of making a placeholder item that Ren was talking about. Um, so we're going to call it example because that's a cool item to unpack. <laughs> uh, we're going to give it a size, we're going to give it a color, and um, there we go, and then we're going to create item. What this is doing is creating a prefab item on, on the pro in the project, and now if we go into the uh, editor mode, we can actually find it, because it's already refreshed the game, and we can just add it to the game. Notice that we're still in play mode, we never stop playing, and we're adding a couple of, couple of examples to the level. Now we can go back into the, level, uh, the item creator, select the item, and actually it's too tall, it should be shorter. Boop. And what's happening is it's actually saving the entire state of the game, refreshing everything to get the prefabs back and reloading it, and it's seamless, you don't even see it happen, but it just feels intuitive and immediate which is the point of the tool. Now, we want to add an extra property to this tool. We're going to make it hangable on a wall, like a poster. So we've added this wall state to it. We've set the wall size. And notice it still doesn't have any art. We're just, we're just figuring out this item. And now the item can go on a wall. And so this is kind of our workflow, where we wanted everything to be kind of, if we want to add an item at the last minute, we want to be able to do that. If we wanted to build the stuff out early, you know, it was a tool that was supposed to be able to use throughout development. That's not it. Oh, oh there we go. Oh, <laughs> Just let me do it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so by the end, uh, the item tool had become embedded in our workflow in many ways. Uh, you could create placeholders easily, add sprites with an autofill system, set zones where items were allowed, add and man manage visual variants, find items by browsing, search by name, selecting from the project, or picking from the game scene and any changes you made could be pushed into live gameplay. I asked him about doing a UX pass on this tool too. He said yes and regretted it when I came back with more edits than he expected. The biggest change was the addition of a search function, which was more of a feature request than a UX change really. But um, other than that, I grouped together features that were related to each other. For example, Tim, you want to help me with pointing again? Um, putting the item properties section next to the dimensions sections, they felt, they felt like they go together. I simplified text on buttons. For instance, you can now see how the state section is easier to parse at a glance. Um, it's got arrows instead of previous and next and less repetition of words. I also added a clone item button and a discard changes button. The original tool was already good, but because it's something that evolved over time to have more features, they had gotten a bit messy. And you can tell how something like a discard changes button, for example, was revealed to be necessary through using the tool a lot. Sometimes it helps to stop and assess how your tools are working and whether they can be cleaned up and improved a bit. Uh, and Tim implemented everything I asked for here, so thank you, Tim. Uh, the search function ended up being super useful for everyone, being, uh, for everyone working on the project. Of course, once you have level grids defined and a way to create items, you need some way to combine them so you can actually have some gameplay. The fastest way to get some gameplay going was to manually position some box prefabs uh, and give them lists of the items they contained, which is what we did. The main, or the main downside was that there was a huge disconnect between the items in the boxes and the rooms that they were meant to be added to. It's the kind of solution you could run with at a game jam to get a proof of concept over the line, but we always knew we'd need something better than that for a full game. The way we ended up approaching it was splitting it into three parts. Placing a bunch of items in a level, uh, then putting down some boxes, and then packing up the items inside those boxes. And now it's my turn to do the video, oh no. 
So this is arrange mode. Uh, we just click arrange, we've got play, arrange, and packing. So I've got this giant list of items that I can uh, put in the level, but I can change it to only show me certain rooms, certain um, surfaces. So like this is anything that can be placed on a coffee table. So here we go, here's some coasters. Just pick them up and I can put as many of them as I want. Um, trying to decide what item to put next. Here we go, record player. And we've got a little decked out coffee table. Let's do some shelves. So, and let's go a bit faster. So we've got action figures. I can also flick between different um, types of like the same item, like books and DVDs with a, um, a key shortcut. So that's how I can put a lot of DVDs down fast. Gotta have some chicks. I can search, so I was looking for the terrarium. I can uh, hang uh, hangable items too. You'll notice these don't actually have another state. They can only be hanged because these can't be moved. So we didn't have to bother with giving them extra art. We can switch between rooms just like we can in game because this is in play mode. Um, um, let's. Uh, just fill out this room too. Of course, gotta have the pig. <laughs> All right, so we're back here. We finished arranging, now it's time to pack. So we go into packing mode. And uh, start bringing out boxes. So th there's different size boxes, there's a medium box. We've got small boxes as well. I arranged these poorly, so now there's no room. I have to move things around. Secret, you can technically put a bigger box on top of a smaller box. I'm about to show you that. Yes. <laughs> and now there's room. I'll place some boxes down here too. That's in front of the door, that's terrible. Um, once you select a box, it highlights it, and you can select any items you want. The items are highlighted in red if they're not uh, in, uh, packed in any box. Uh, and once they are packed, when the box is selected, it shows you them in blue and shows you lines from them as well to show you they're going in this box. So I'm just packing up all the items. As long as there's still red ones, I'm not done. It's all just click to select. Um, Click again to deselect. I think it might have been right click. God, it's been a while. And let's switch rooms. Pack some things in this room. But another thing I can do is I can pack things from other rooms into, into a different room. So now the pig is packed in the living room and this chick is packed in the other room. And so it kind of helps us see what items are supposed to be in this room, but, uh, but are packed elsewhere. I can rearrange the items in the list so they, I can control the order that they come out. I can also control the states they're in. Um, oh, there's also unmovable items, so I can decide that you can't move these, so you can't hang your diploma, sorry. Oh. <laughs> But there's also movable items, so you can move everything else here. Um, but it doesn't come out of boxes, it's already in the level. And yeah, I can flick between them, see what's packed, what's unmovable, what's movable. And for movable items, I can also move them around like that. So I can put the terrarium on a box, for example. Um, it's the only way to get items uh, to start on boxes. And so we've gone through all of these. Now it's time to play. So you gotta play test it. Make sure everything feels right. So I can't move these. This is, these are both moved and movable. OK, 
can take out everything I packed. Actually, in the game, we didn't pack any books upright. It was like on purpose. They were all sideways, so you couldn't just put them in the same state. I didn't. I wasn't very careful while packing this room for this demonstration. And here's Pig, and he can go to the other room where he belongs. And here's that chick that belongs in the other room with the other chicks united at last. And that's it. Oh, that. So that was, that was a pretty long video. There's a lot to unpack in it. A, so let's break this down into item placement, box placement, and packing. We'll start with item placement. It's fast and easy to add items to a level, remove them, um, or move them around a room or even between rooms. When designing a level and unpacking, we always started with a room full of items, effectively a solved level. Our item placement tool let us do that in editor. Populating the room with items let us visualize just how much space items take and how much room is left to allow players to make creative decisions. We use this tool in combination with the item tool to change the shape and size of items and add placeholder items. We were also able to go back to the zoning tool to add and remove grid nodes to adjust the amount of space available after seeing how items fit. As for box placement, the box placement tool works very similarly to the item placement tool, except rather than items, it let us place different sized boxes around the level anywhere there are grids. The placement of boxes matters because they're part of the layout of the level. Their positioning affects the pacing of the game. If you have just one stack of three boxes, for example, the player has to go through them linearly, one by one, whereas if they're scattered around the room, the player can unpack them in any order. They also block access to certain areas of, the room, of a room, so clearing a box can effectively unlock access to a, a set of drawers or a shelf that was previously obscured. People keep telling us to make a prequel to unpacking called Packing, where you pack up all of the items in an apartment into boxes. Well, this tool was basically that. It let us assign items to specific boxes and rearrange the order of the items inside each box. We could even set the state of each item. For example, if a plush toy is facing left or right or away from the camera, or if a shirt is folded or hanging. As you saw, items that haven't been packed are highlighted in red, uh, and when you select a box, all the items that are packed in it are highlighted in blue. Not every item has to be packed. The tool lets us make some items immovable, so they are already placed at the start of a level and can't be moved, like in the housemaid stage. Or we could mark the items as movable, like the items, like most of the items, in the boyfriend's apartment. Movable items can also have a new position assigned to, uh, assigned to them, which was useful in making the boyfriend's items take up as much space on his shelves as possible. Mm -hmm. It was also how we were able to put items on top of boxes, so things like a potted plant or the beetle terrarium didn't have to go inside of a box and suffocate, uh, but could still look like they came with our main character. So at some point, when you have enough data, the logical place to put it so you can keep track of things is a spreadsheet. The challenge then becomes how to get that data out of a spreadsheet and use it. So there's various ways to load spreadsheet data into a game, but for us, we wanted to keep the process fluid. Information needed to travel both directions and be done as many times as possible without waiting for data to be considered final. In fact, embracing the idea that art, design, and audio might continue to make edits until the very end should, uh, and should be able to do so without ruining anyone else's work was a big consideration of how we designed our tools in general. So this is the audio spreadsheet uh, tool, AKA the big one. Uh, Jeff, and, Jeff and Ange were working on the unpacking's item Foley system and needed to keep track of vast amounts of audio data for all the lovely varied Foley sounds you hear when you place items on different surfaces. I wrote an importer that could download the spreadsheet da data directly from Google Sheets with a Unity web request and then match the data to the items in the project. The main purpose was to show any items that had audio data that didn't match the spreadsheet and then update the in-game items all at once with a button press. But it quickly expanded into also identifying renamed items, items in the game that weren't in the spreadsheet, 
items in the spreadsheet that weren't in the game, and other useful cases. For items not in the spreadsheet, it could create a TSV file suitable for appending. The goal was to create a flexible tool that could handle frequent and sweeping audio changes, but also didn't require us to lock down the item list. Yeah, I know. We used this approach again for Ren with the item list creator. She tracked items in a spreadsheet to work with artists, and I wrote a tool that could show the uh, that would show the room uh, room's current stage uh, yes, rooms in the current stage and load the appropriate spreadsheet. From there, it would show any items that were in the game but not in the spreadsheet, items that were in the spreadsheet but not in the game, or items that existed but didn't have the same listed properties. For example, their their dimensions. Um, there were even buttons to add items that were meant to be in a level directly into the game. So it was very flexible to, uh, it was feasible to design a level by listing the items that were supposed to be in a room uh, in a spreadsheet and then use this tool to add the items until they're all there. It was a very flexible tool. Localization is another area where spreadsheets are the norm. In the game, we had string tables and tools to easily add string IDs. Um, and then once it was all worked out, uh, we could add them to the spreadsheet. Once I had all the English strings worked out, we sent a copy of the spreadsheet off to the localization team, and what we got back slotted straight back in. We'd receive back a batch of languages, I'd open up the import tool and hit sync with spreadsheet, update all, and they'd all be in the game. The tool was also uh, helpful for testing. I could switch between languages on the fly uh, and show the string IDs above every text field, uh, which made tracking down issues and creating helpful screenshots very easy. It was also the logical place to put some, uh, some a tool to detect missing glyphs in fonts. Anytime we ran into something that was slowing us down, we considered whether a tool would be useful for it. So here are a bunch of smaller tools we ended up creating for more specific tasks. This will be pretty rapid fire. So the audio audit tool was a specialized and very intimidating tool requested by Jeff to track down specific audio cases. It pulls together item data, spreadsheet data, and level data from across the game to show what items could hypothetically interact with what. It's searchable, and the results are color-coded to help with spotting patterns, but you can mouse over an entry to show the specific stages an item is used in, and uh, this is an example of using brute force data aggregation to give someone on the team the data they needed. Any sprite that was added to the project needed to be individually aligned to the grid. Unity lets you adjust pivot points, uh, but it uses a value from zero to one, and that doesn't work great with aligning pixel sprites to a pixel grid. I see some people nodding. <laughs> Enter the pivot editor, a little tool for moving items by pixel size increments to make sure they were aligned both to the pixel grid and to their bounding box. Being able to, being able to switch resolutions with a shortcut was simple but very useful. I created a script with an editor, editor shortcut that cycled the game window size through the resolutions we knew we needed to support. As well as changing Unity's in-game resolution, it also called the right functions in the game uh, on, on various scripts. This made it easier to test scenes where elements had to dynamically adjust, like the album, which had to slide uh, various pieces around to look good at different resolutions. The item placement tool, which we showed before, let us select an item to see all the zones where it was allowed to go in play mode, as you saw. But I also wanted a tool that did the reverse. The item zoning adjustment tool let me select a zone and see a list of every item in the game that was allowed to go there. This was useful for occasional sweeps to find if any item was allowed to go somewhere weird, or if some obvious items weren't zoned for places where they should be able to go. So the three tools on this slide had very specific uses, but still represented a good work to result ratio. Um, we added the concept of variance so that an item could have multiple appearances. Think different mug designs or books with different cover art. The variant consolidator scanned all these items to detect likely cases where multiple items could be just one item, and then automated the process of combining them, including fixing references in existing levels. The pivot checker scanned for pivots that didn't neatly fit on the grid and was good at detecting art changes that had been missed. And the stack lister listed what could stack on what, and it was just kind of a sanity check. We often recorded GIFs of unpacking for our social media, but we couldn't just record them with the stage as it was. There are multiple post effects applied to each stage. In this case, a gradient for the background, a vignette, and a bloom effect. 
and those add a lot more colors to the image, which make for GIFs that are large in file size and don't look great. Um, GIF mode is a simple toggle that turns off all the post effects for a stage, making it possible to record GIFs that aren't huge and don't have banding and other artifacts. One of my, one of my favorite simple tricks was just shoveling some functionality into a button stuck to the thing in, in question. So if a script component, like a drawer or a towel rack, had some specific setup rules, like needing a material set a, a certain way, or some value that could be calculated from another value, um, or needing to be connected to some other object in the scene that was always going to be done in a certain way, I just put all these steps in a fix button. Not only did it save me time when I was setting things up, but it meant I had less specific things to remember because it was now effectively documented in this code. So that was an overview of the tools we used to build our game. While putting together this talk, we noticed some through lines that apply to making tools for any project. It's helpful to start off by doing tasks manually first to figure out what you actually need your tools to be able to do. If you make a tool based on assumptions, you may end up with something that doesn't actually address the right problems and won't get used. It's also better to have a partial tool that does some of the job than having no tool at all. A small and limited tool will still save you time, and it can evolve into something bigger over the course of development. If you're a programmer looking to empower your team, or just even yourself, keep in mind that useful tools are the ones that get used a lot. So you need to double check your assumptions and pay attention to the tasks that people are actually doing frequently. Ideally, you should also use your own tools and see what issues you run into. And don't forget that the little things matter too. Rearranging UI to make more sense or preventing an edge case where the tool can do something unexpected if steps are done out of order, make a tool more approachable and lets everyone concentrate on the creative stuff. And for non-programmers like me, don't be afraid to ask your programmers for tools where you need them. It takes time and work up front, sure, but it pays off for the whole team in the long run. That's it. Thanks for coming to our talk. Right. Does, I, yeah, does anyone have any questions for us? We have a little bit of time still. Hi, thanks. Uh, great talk. Uh, in the item creation uh, tool, there was a field which was called sweetener. What does that do? <laughs> so that was for Jeff. <laughs> come, uh, come here. To the sorry. Yeah, that was that was a that was a request from Jeff. Uh, basically, uh, it was to make the foley more varied. You could add an extra sound effect that was played on top of another sound effect. So if you had a, a clunk sound of it going on a on a desk, it could also play a jingle sound if it was keys. And so that's my understanding of what a sweetener is. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, excellent talk, thank you. Um, so cost and benefit of making, spending time making tools, I'm curious what uh, processes you went through of determining when is it worth making this tool, are we over polishing it, how much time is it actually saving, um, was it vibes based, did you, did you have measurements, uh, how did you go about doing that? I think it was pretty vibes based, hey. Um, Tim was across a lot of different things. He was not just doing the tools, he was programming almost the entire game. So uh, it was a bit of juggling um, to you know, try to fit in tool making around other things. Tim, if you want to elaborate. Yeah, a lot of it come back, came back to the idea of like, how many times am I hypothetically going to do this? And if it is more than once, I'm already thinking maybe a tool would be a good idea <laughs> because it's probably going to be more than once. Uh, thanks. Uh, what, how do you just you store all the data for the items in the rooms? Are you just using prefabs or do you have some other mechanism to store all those attributes? <laughs> so because of, because of Ren's request to edit the levels live, we used a uh, intermediate format. So basically every time you're placing an item, it's writing a, uh, our own format to a, a, f a file on disk because that one can be read and uh, read and read back 
re uh, regardless of whether you're in play mode or not. So we just use that. And then when we did builds, it would pull the data out of that and combine it into a prefab, uh, into a scripted object to, for the actual gameplay. But well, whenever we're editing the levels, it was using this custom file format. But I will but, say the items but, are prefabs. Like oh yeah, the items all of the items are prefabs, prefabs. But the item data in levels. Yes. Yep. Cool. Thanks. Hi, um, I've dabbled a little in making tools in Unity, um, and <laughs> handling UI stuff uh, has been a nightmare. Do you have any just like vague tips for as you're doing your UI passes? <laughs> Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it sucks. Um, the, main <laughs> the, the main thing is like not to fight Unity, in my, my opinion. Like, you know, use, they've got the auto layout tools, and they're not perfect, but they, you know, try not to go against what they're trying to do. Like, they've got this idea, there's a bunch of ideas about like insets and auto, you know, auto resizing and things like that. And the more you can make use of what they wanted to do, it's, it's easier. That's, that was basically my, my approach. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks heaps for an awesome talk. Um, you might have just answered this, but um, did you make all your uh, tools in the Unity editor like natively, or did you use something like Odin Inspector? Uh, yeah, just natively, though, yeah. All right, that's ex extremely impressive. <laughs> um, as someone who is kind of just looking into getting into tooling, um, do you have any recommended resources for picking it up? Because, yeah, it's quite impressive the stuff you've made. So are there like any any like uh, YouTube channels or something that you would refer to a lot when you were trying to build these tools or, or to learn how to build them? Ooh, I'm trying, I can't think of any specific examples. I mean, the main thing is like getting buttons down, like getting your head around the, 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 basic, the basic metaphors for like how to draw a button, how to make a slider work and stuff like that. And then just like all these tools were built from the ground up. Like the first versions looked really stupid and just like had buttons everywhere. And they only got needed up as we went along. And then, and then later Ren would come and give me a UX pass to do. So it, like it's really intimidating to look at the final result. But the earliest versions were just like a gray box with a button on them kind of thing. And I just kind of scaled up from there. Yeah, I don't have a lot to contribute here. Oh, <laughs> I didn't make these tools. Tim is the awesome one here. Yeah, sorry, just on that front, with the t have you now started using Unity's new like USS and UXML way of doing all of the editor UI? So I've started looking at that. Like basically, obviously, you know, we built with what we kind of had easily at the time. Uh, I've started having a look at that. For other reasons, I've stopped having a look at that for now. <laughs> <laughs> started browsing some other engines, reference pages. Oh. Um, so yeah. Uh, we've got a couple more questions. Oh, uh, you, you had really enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much. Uh, how did you best approach asking for tools uh, in the case of uh, you know, describing that? Did it have to change over time? Uh, yeah. A question for me. Thank you. <laughs> um, basically, like when we were first coming up with what, how we want to make this game and what, what we need, like, uh, yeah, it, it kind of came about from um, kind of like as we said in the talk, uh, you do something and you do it manually and you're like, wow, it sure would be useful to be able to do this uh, in a more automated way. Like this, this is extremely tedious. Uh, and I'd be like, Tim, is there something that I could do like to, to like edit this live? Actually, the, the editing things in play mode came from watching uh, someone do a demonstration from like, what was it? from Play Dead, um, we saw that they were doing something live like that. And I was like, Tim, can we do something like this? And Tim's like, what are you? No. OK, <laughs> fine. Um, but yeah, any anything that I was like, well, I'm doing this a lot. Like Tim also, there's a lot of other uh, tools that we didn't show. Like I've got uh, even things out of Unity. Like I've got. Um, these these XML files, 
files that, that um, are set up to export things from a sprite so that I don't need to export manually. Um, so yeah, anything that was tedious and needed to be done multiple times, I'd be like, Tim, is there anything, like, can, can I get a tool that does this? Yeah. Uh, we got to wrap up. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, we'll be around. Um, feel free to ask us. Thank you so much for coming to our talk. Thank you.